So what we now want to do is show that if we have a sequence for which the limit superior exists, that one, the limit superior is a limit point for the sequence, i.e. that there is a subsequence that converges to the limit superior, and two, that it's the maximum of the limit points, i.e. there is no bigger number such that there is a subsequence of your sequence that converges to that value. Similarly, we also want to show that if you have a sequence where the limit inferior exists, that again, that the limit inferior is a limit point, i.e. that there is a subsequence that converges to it, and two, that there is no smaller limit point, i.e. there is no value smaller than it, such that there is a subsequence that converges to that value. So let's start with the limit superior case. So let's say we've got our sequence here, our sequence A, and we're assuming that this sequence has a limit superior. So the limit superior as n approaches infinity of a n exists and it is equal to this value that we'll call L. So the first part of the proof is I want to show that this is a limit point. L is a limit point, i.e. that I can find a subsequence of the original sequence that converges to this value L. So how am I going to find a subsequence then that converges to this value L? Well, I've drawn a picture to illustrate my strategy. So here's the real line. Here is L in the real line. And I'm going to take smaller and smaller intervals around L and find terms from the sequence that are inside those intervals. And as I, I'm going to half the size of the interval each time. So the intervals are going to become smaller and smaller and smaller indeed getting indefinitely small, and by finding terms that are inside these, I will then have a sequence that gets and stays indefinitely close to this value L. And I'm going to show that I can find terms in the sequence that are inside each of these progressively smaller intervals, which are in the right order uh, to form a subsequence. So I'm going to start off with an interval of radius 1, so the interval from L minus 1 to L plus 1, which is an interval centred around L, and I'm going to find the first term of my subsequence by finding a term of the sequence that is inside here. So how can I show that there must be a term in the sequence that's inside this interval? So what I know is that the limit superior is equal to L, and therefore I know that the sequence of supremums, which I've written out here, this converges to L. We know that this is a monotonically decreasing sequence and that it converges to L. So by definition of this sequence converging to L, I can now use this interval of size or radius 1 as, I can use 1 as epsilon in the epsilon definition of convergence of this sequence to L and say that there must be a term in this sequence such that that term and all terms beyond it are inside this interval of length 1 around L. So I've called this term the term S big N, and it and all the other terms are now inside this interval of length 1 around L. So I've drawn that on the picture here is Sn inside that interval. Also note, on this picture, I've drawn Sn on the right of L, i.e. it's greater than L in this picture. And that's something that we know, um, that it cannot be on the left side here, that it has to be greater than or equal to L. And the smallest it could be is L itself. And that's because this is a monotonically decreasing sequence. So it's a sequence that is coming down and converging on L. Now, it could be the case that it has already got to L and it's now a constant sequence from this point on. So Sn could be equal to L itself, but that's the smallest it could be. It could not be something that's smaller than L because of the fact that we know that this is a monotonically decreasing sequence. So we know it's in this half of this interval, not this half. Now, so we've got this point Sn, but of course we want to turn from the original sequence that's inside this interval around L. So we're now going to have to apply the definition of Sn here. It, it itself is the supremum of a whole bunch of terms from the sequence. It's the supremum of all the terms in the sequence from A big N onwards, so the supremum of this set here. I'm going to use this definition of Sn to then show that I can find a term in the sequence that must be inside this interval. So because this number S big N is the least upper bound of this set, 
One, that means it's an upper bound. So that means that everything inside this set is less than or equal to it. So all of these terms of the sequence here, they are all less than or equal to this value. So they're all to the left or on this value. They're not up here. But also the fact that it's the least upper bound is incredibly helpful. That means that no number that is strictly smaller than it is an upper bound for this set. So if you take any number that's smaller than s big N, there must be something inside this set that is strictly bigger than that, because otherwise it would be an upper bound, contradicting this being the least upper bound. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this value Sn and I'm going to subtract off the length of the interval here. I'm going to subtract off 1. So I've taken this new point here, which is S big N just minus 1. And I've tried to make that distance between them look the same as this distance, because so that the picture is consistent. And the crucial thing about this is that this gap between the two is now contained inside my interval of radius 1 around L. And the reason that's guaranteed to be the case is that I know that Sn is inside this part of the interval. The smallest it can be is L, and it's certainly not up here at L plus 1 because it has to be strictly inside that interval by the way that we picked Sn. And therefore, say it was here, if you subtract 1 off it, then that means that Sn minus 1 will be at this same value here, L minus 1, but that's the most extreme case for all the other cases where it's properly in between L and L plus 1, then this is going to be somewhere properly in between here. Now, that's important for the argument that I'm about to now say. So because I know that this cannot be an upper bound for this set, otherwise it would contradict this being the least upper bound because it's a number smaller than it, which is an upper bound, so I know this cannot be an upper bound, therefore I know that there must be something inside here that is strictly greater than it, i.e. is strictly inside this interval here, or not necessarily strictly inside, it could be equal to Sn, but strictly greater than this and less than or equal to this, so inside here. And that therefore forces there to be an element from the sequence that is inside the interval of radius one around L. So I now know that there is something here that is in there, find that element that's inside there, and then I'm going to take that as the first term of my subsequence. So I'm going to call that term of the sequence that I found A M1. So this is how I'm naming my subsequence of the sequence A. So K here denotes which entry in my subsequence you are. So when you're 1, that's the first term of the subsequence. When it's 2, that's the second term of the subsequence. 3, that's the third term of the subsequence, etc. And then this function m of k is going to then take each of the k values and turn it into the term that it is in the original sequence. So that's how I'm notating my subsequence. And now I've told you how to find this first term in my subsequence, a m1. Uh, and I'm just going to recap the whole argument here. So to find the first term of my subsequence, I take an interval of radius 1 around L, so the interval L minus 1 to L plus 1, and I say because the limit superior is equal to L, that means that my sequence of supremums converges to L. It's a monotonically decreasing sequence converging to L. By the definition of convergence of that sequence, I can say that there must be a term in this sequence where that term and all terms beyond it are within this interval of length of radius 1 around L. Find that term and we'll use that term here. So it's here on the picture. Then what I can do is, because that term corresponds to the supremum of a set of terms of the sequence, I can then say, go down by 1, so go to Sn minus 1, and because I know that Sn is strictly greater than L, I know that this section of the real line in between Sn minus 1 and Sn is still going to be contained within my interval of radius 1 around L. Now what I can say is because I know that this is not an upper bound, because it would contradict this being the least upper bound of this set, that there must be something inside this set that is strictly bigger than that, but less than or equal to that, i.e. inside this portion of the real line, uh, this sort of heart, uh, I mean, it's an open interval at this end, it doesn't include Sn minus 1, but it's closed at this side, Sn, it's somewhere inside there, and that, I know, is entirely contained within this 
interval of radius 1 around L. And hence, I've found a term, and that's the, of the original sequence that is inside this interval of radius 1. I'm going to use that as my first term of the subsequence. Now for my second term of the subsequence, I'm going to now consider a smaller interval around the value L. I'm going to consider the interval L minus a half to L plus a half. So we've halved the size of the interval now. And this is what we're going to continue doing. When we go to the third term, we're going to get a smaller interval again. And we could either half the interval size each time we go to the next term of the subsequence. Or if you find it simpler, we could just do um, an interval of radius 1 over k. So the next one would be radius a third. The next one would, after that would be a radius quarter. Either way, it doesn't matter as long as the intervals are getting progressively smaller and are converging down to being indefinitely small, we're going to be guaranteed that our subsequence is converging to L that way. So whichever way you prefer, I think I might actually, um, just for a simpler pattern, take intervals of radius 1 over k. So for my second term of the subsequence, k is equal to 2, I've got an interval of radius 1 over k, which is 1 over 2. Now, same argument holds true. Because of the fact that the limit superior is equal to L, the sequence of supremums converges to L. Therefore, again, I can use now epsilon is equal to a half and say that there must exist a term in this sequence, which we'll now call S n2. Uh, and I'm recycling the same picture, so I've just changed this to 2 now to distinguish it from that first one. You could think of this as n1, if you like, that we were using up here. So again, there is a term in this sequence where it and all the terms beyond it are inside this half interval, this interval of radius a half around L. And again, they're monotonically converging down to L. And again, I'm going to do the same sort of argument again. I'm going to say, remember what the definition of this is. It's the supremum of a whole bunch of terms of the original sequence. And now I can go down, not by 1 anymore, because 1 was the number that worked up in this case where our interval had radius 1. Now our interval has radius a half, so now I'm going to take minus a half. So if I take Sn2 minus a half, that will be kind of here on the picture. And again, I'm guaranteed that everything that is strictly greater than that and less than or equal to Sn2 is going to be contained inside my interval of radius a half around L because of the fact that I know Sn2 is on this side here. It's greater than or equal to the value L. It's not on this side. So if I go down by a half, um, up to a half, if I go down by actually a half, I could be right on the cusp here, which isn't included inside the open interval. But of course, I, I'm not actually interested in that point because I'm going to use my argument now of there being a term in the sequence that is strictly greater than it. Uh, and that, therefore, would be guaranteed to be inside this interval of radius a half around L. The issue, you might think that, brilliant, this looks brilliant, I can now find a term in the sequence that is inside there and therefore is inside the half interval around L, and therefore I'll put that as the second term of my subsequence. There is one complexity here, which is that how am I guaranteed that that next term that I'm putting in the subsequence is actually after this one, because I don't want it to be the case that actually the term that I put here is actually ahead of this one in the original sequence. So I could have maybe this one being, I don't know, in position maybe here on the uh, original sequence, and then I could end up with putting something here that's actually ahead of it, and that's nonsense, that's not okay. Remember, the terms that appear here in the subsequence have to be in the right order as they appear in the original sequence. So there's a complexity here. So the way I get around this is I remember that actually it's not just the case that this Sn2 is within the half into around L. It's the case that it and all the supremums after it in this sequence are inside that interval. Remember the definition is you get and stay indefinitely close. Uh, indeed, for any epsilon you can find a point where the sequence is within that epsilon distance and every term afterwards is also within that epsilon distance. It gets and stays within epsilon distance of L for all epsilon. 
So what I can now do is instead of picking this first one, I can make sure that I go far enough along that actually I'm past this term. So M1 here is some term in the original sequence, AM1, some term in the original sequence. Maybe M1 turned out to be 62, for example, and we took the 62th term from the original sequence and put it as the first term of our subsequence. I now say, if this, let's say this S N2, let's say N2 was 40. That's a problem because 40 is less than 62, I think I said, as M1 here. I can get around this problem and then all of my argument could be flawed from then on because the thing that I might then be taking from the set that's inside this bit here might actually be ahead. It might be, for example, A42 and that would be a problem. But what I can do is go along to S63 here, which is beyond A62, that's my first term in the subsequence, and I know that that will also be inside this half into around L, and I know that the set that it is the supremum of will not contain those first 62 elements of the original sequence, and therefore they're all gone from the options of things that I would pick as the thing that is inside here. And this way I can get around this problem. So writing this formally out, the way that I'm going to pick N2 is more complicated. Previously I was just saying pick N2 such that for all little n greater than or equal to N2, the distance between Sn and the limit L is less than a half. Now I'm going to add in this condition, also make sure that N2 is strictly greater than M1. So that's the way I'm going to solve this problem. And for the reason that I've argued here, the way in which it's not just the case that you get to one term that's within the epsilon distance of L, you get a term and all terms beyond it are within that epsilon distance of L. The whole tail of the sequence is inside the epsilon distance of L. It means that I can always find a big N2 that satisfies both of these criteria, not just this one. So continuing the argument on then, I know that Sn2 is equal to the supremum of the set of all terms of the sequence from n2 onwards, so an2, an2 plus 1, etc. And I can then think about going to Sn2 minus a half, and I know that that term is not going to be an upper bound for this set because it would contradict Sn2 being the least upper bound of the set. Therefore, there must be something inside here that is strictly greater than that value, Sn2 minus a half, and that means that I'm going to have a term in the original sequence that is inside here, strictly greater than that, and less than or equal to that, and that means it will be contained inside this interval of radius a half around L. And I'm going to take that term as the second term of my subsequence, and I am guaranteed that it is in the right order, i.e. it's further along in the sequence than this one, because of the fact that everything inside this set was further along in the sequence than this one, because N2 is strictly greater than M1. So that's how I will then pick my second term of the subsequence, A, M2. We'll have a break here and we'll continue this argument in the next video.